listening to a 4x4, 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Are you ready? It's the Jeep Talk Show with Wendy. There will be body damage. Jeep Mama. Are you sure? Josh. Yeah, I don't think so. And Tony. I think that's a huge deal. So sit back, strap in, and brace yourself. Hey, it's time for me to remind you again to get out there and let your friends and followers know about the Jeep Talk Show trying to increase listenership and uh you know you're here you're listening uh shouldn't you put the uh (laughs) pass along the good or the bad news with everybody else so go over there and uh you know if you if you uh, follow us on facebook twitter uh where else we're on the tic tac uh which i'm not supposed to say that anymore i'm supposed to say tic tac anyway uh like what we uh, what we post share what we post and uh tell just random people out walking walking their dog (laughs) <laughs> Let them know about the Jeep Talk Show. We really appreciate everything that everybody's done so re- already. You know, the JTS team is here to inform and entertain you uh, about Jeeps. If you're new to the Jeep world or thinking about jumping in and getting your feet dirty, you're in the right place. Whether you're interested in having a unique off-road vehicle ready to hit the trails or that daily driver that's also a weekend warrior, this show is for you. Find out more information about the Jeep Talk Show at jeeptalkshow.com. That's where it's all at. Glad you're here, Jeeper. I'm Josh, and on this episode, I've got some recall news that may affect a Jeep in your driveway. Jeep has a new top that actually might finally be the best of both worlds. And I've also got a story about the world's longest test drive. Seriously. And later, we wrap up our multi-part series in hardtop repair. Oh, good. Uh, just in time for winter. So, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I'm... I'm jumping this on on you kind of uh, out of the blue josh i know but uh, i think you've done some welding and i thought it might be a good idea to talk a little bit about welding tonight uh i mean really just from the beginnings because i've never welded i've uh, never had a welding machine which obviously we go along with that first statement so uh hopefully we can have a little conversation about just welding here and uh yeah, we'll, a few get, uh, we'll touch on a few a uh, few little things here and there and uh and peel back a few layers of uh, of that onion Let's keep it uh, keep it simple. You know, I'm a simple person. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Local Jeep news, national Jeep news, and news from around the world. It's this week in Jeep. And this week in Jeep does start off with a recall alert. Now, according to an official document released by the NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, certain vehicles have a potentially defective master switch, which prevents drivers from turning on the high beams. When the master lighting switch is set to the automatic position near the auto position, the high beam headlights will not activate unless the master lighting switch is first changed to the on position, the safety agency explains. Now, due to this concern, the 2021 Grand Cherokee L vehicles in question failed to comply with the requirements of Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard Number 108 for lamps, reflective devices, and associated equipment. Just about 7,100 Jeeps are affected in total for this recall with an estimated defect rate of 100%. So if you think yours isn't it, uh, think again. <laughs> the Grand Cherokee L's included in the safety campaign were assembled between December 8th, 2020 and August 5th, 25th rather, 2021. Those not included in the recall population are said to have been equipped with automatic high beams or made after the suspect period. The planned dealer and owner notification is scheduled for December 3rd or before, according to NHTSA. Now, affected owners should schedule an appointment with their local authorized Jeep dealer where technicians will inspect each vehicle, reprogramming them accordingly. The feds also state that, quote, this recall is not the result of a park defect, but rather incomplete system design parameters. In other words, all that driver assistant technology that is there to help you once again is getting in the way. Those who have already fixed the issue on their own will be reimbursed by the automaker if they can prove it via the original receipt or other payment methods. If you've been affected by this issue, please give us a call and share with us your experience. You know, um, before, I mean, having the 98 uh, Jeep Cherokee, you don't really think of creature comforts uh, starting... Getting no. from point A to point B. Yeah, that, that's uh, about it. AC working. You know, those those are kind of the creature comforts that you're you're used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and don't get me wrong. In '98, the 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 things that the 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 uh, Cherokee Classic that I had, uh, it had everything on it that you could get from the factory. Uh, even had the uh, upcountry uh, lift. So uh, it was. Really, I guess that would be kind of the equivalent of the Rubicon uh, version. 
But anyway, it was uh, it was it was a nice Jeep. But it wasn't until I got this 2021 Jeep Gladiator that oh there were certain things in there that I can see how might cause issues. Like I'm sure you've seen people driving down the road. Uh, it's it's too dark. It's either dark or it's too dark because of the weather, the uh, the the cloud cover, and so on and so forth. Driving without any lights on. Oh yeah, and I, I think yeah, I think I might better. Uh, they're probably just idiots, but I think I may better understand how that could happen to me now because on the Gladiator you have an automatic uh, setting for the headlights, uh, so you just flip it over there and leave it there, and it's going to turn the headlights on and off depending on the what it d- determines uh, is uh, yeah, there's a little light light sensor on the dash. Yeah, uh, and, and and it you know determining on a. D- Depending on what kind of you know lumens it's seeing, uh, it may or may not be turning on your lights when you want it to. But now imagine somebody else is driving your vehicle and they switch it over to just running lights, and or they turn it off altogether, and you're just driving down the road going, "This is something I don't have to worry about. <laughs> the the vehicle will take care of it for me." And now you're driving uh, not safely uh, by not having you know this, even the running lights on. So I can better understand how this automation can cause issues uh, and, and could cause an accident because of it. But and this whole time, you've just been thinking that, oh, there's Josh on a rant again for no reason whatsoever. But <laughs> <laughs> now you're starting to understand a little bit where I'm coming from. Oh, absolutely. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's really nice. It's just something I don't have to mess with. But it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to, for me to check that. And all, it, it's kind of hard for me to see. I don't know if you remember when you were driving the, the Gladiator. There's uh, uh, some controls there, uh, lower uh, left-hand side. And you really can't see oh, them with the steering wheel right. in the way. So, uh, But reaching up over there and just turning that big knob, uh, making sure it's, it's full right, will make sure that it's uh, in that automatic setting. Uh, but even then, got the muscle memory incorporated in it. It's not even this the, the position. You know that it's full right is where it needs to be. Yep. And and you can you know, not even looking, just reach over there and 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 fiddle with the knob and verify. Okay, it's turned all the way. You know, uh, clockwise. I'm good to go. Oh, and in fact, I I would have to stop what I was doing and look at the knob to see how it just to turn the lights on because I don't just <laughs> turn the lights on. I don't just don't don't just turn on the the the, the running lights. It's auto, auto or off. That's the only two things because that's full left or full right. So, oh, yeah, uh, it's it's like they used to say when calculators came out. And you're you're not gonna let you you're gonna forget how to add and subtract for the calculator. Calculators aren't you know, can't have them in the classroom. <laughs> forget how to turn on the headlights. Yeah, yeah. Uh, too funny. Too funny. Well, according to Stellantis, the newest Mopar offering from the Jeep Performance Parts Division is the new Sunrider Flip Top Roof. Jeep customers have for decades enjoyed removable soft and hard tops, each taking turns over the years as the standard equipment for the Jeep Wrangler. Now, both Jeep Wranglers and Gladiators have standard and premium soft tops available, as well as hard top options. Although they look identical, the premium versions of between the uh, soft tops are made with a more durable canvas material instead of a vinyl material. Both can be easily rolled down without the need for tools, but doing so eats up valuable cargo space. Drivers who want another layer of protection against the elements obviously opt for the removable hardtop. This one can also be optioned with a Mopar headliner for better insulation, plus it can be uh, outfitted with roof racks and other accessories. The downside is that it's bulkier and heavier and isn't as easy to store or remove. While it is expensive, the one-touch sky top roof is also a great option. Much like a sunroof, the whole roof can be rolled back with the press of a button. Panoramic sunroofs are also optional on several other Jeep SUVs, including both Cherokee models. Stellantis says that the new Sunrider flip top is made from black twill fabric, reportedly offering better protection against the elements. Unlike the regular soft top, this one only unrolls for the front row passengers. Think of it as a fabric sunroof for your Wrangler that you operate yourself. The mechanism can be easily flipped forward and back at a moment's notice. The Sunrider flip top can be installed either at the dealership, but the automaker says the installation process is easy enough for the do-it-yourselfer too. The new top is available for 2018 to 2021 Wranglers and all models of the Jeep Gladiator. For both vehicles, it has a suggested retail price of $895. So, what do you think, Tony? I wonder if this is uh, the best top. Uh, I wonder if they've just, you know, branded it for their own and this is really just the best top because I know best top. I was just trying to look it up here real quick uh, to see if it's the, it looks like it's the same one or not. Uh, people really like that fold back uh, cover 
uh, that uh, you know exposes the driver and the passenger side of the mm-hmm. vehicle. Um, well, that's what the uh, the Freedom Top with the JL uh, did. Uh, it gave you that option of removing to those front two panels to expose just the driver and the passenger in the front seat to that, giving them that that open air experience, as it were. Yep, uh, I just pulled it up, and it is. It's even called the same thing: Sunrider for Hardtop on the Best Top site uh, for the uh, the JL, the 2021, uh, also for the 2021 20 and 2021 Gladiator. Um, 750 to 899 is, uh, is what they, uh, what go. it goes for. So no, yeah, I'm, that's what I thought. I figured it was best top. And uh, this is great that, um, that, uh, Jeep is, uh, putting this as a, uh, a performance add on, not from the, not from the factory, but you can buy this separately is, is, is that, that's what that means, right? Correct. Yeah. Now you could, uh, you know, spend the 800, 900 bucks, whatever it is, and, and, you know, go to the dealership, have them put it in. But I'm really kind of curious to see what the procedure is uh, to install this. Uh, If you have to modify the top, if there's cutting involved, uh, how all that would work exactly. Uh, This looks interesting to me. And and it kind of, like I was uh, saying earlier in the show, kind of the best of both worlds, uh, as it were. You kind of get that, the, um, the, the open air that you do with the with the freedom top and, and being able to remove just those front two panels uh, exposing the, uh, the the front two seats to the to the sky as it were uh, but you know with the ease of a soft top but still retaining all the security warmth and protection of a, of a hard top with the rest of the of the of the top of the vehicle so I, I don't know it's interesting engineering I'm, I'm really curious about the installation the modification process to put this in uh, I'm curious about uh, wind noise. Uh, things like that. Uh, is there any water intrusion if the Jeep is facing downhill? Um, it, I, ha- I have a lot of questions. I really want to see one of these in person. Uh, I don't know when they're going to make it to my area, uh, whether or not any of the dealerships are going to put any in, in uh, any show vehicles with limited inventory. So it'll be kind of curious to see when and if uh, we start seeing these things out in the general public. Yep. Um, I like the idea from the standpoint, well, my wife likes it on her. Uh, she has the NX Trek top for her TJ. And it mm-hmm. does it does exactly this. You just flip it back, and you can be driving down the road and flip it back. Although I wouldn't wouldn't uh, recommend doing it about twenty miles an hour. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, certainly in stop and go traffic, or you know, if you're on the on the beach or something, and you you really don't want to stop, you you and a uh, passenger could easily flip this thing back, and you'd have that open air experience. But anyway, uh, but one of the things uh, I mean, I'm always kind of concerned about getting burned. I'm very uh, fair complected. And 15 minutes in the sun is going to give me a, a, a start looking at a good burn. So well, you wear hats a lot too, though, yeah. and and you're already you know your arm is probably already exposed. You have a driving arm, you know that's going to be exposed <laughs> to more UV rays than your other arm. So I mean, you already kind of got some exposure going on, anyways. Yeah, yes, granted, this is sort of opening up, uh, opening you up to harm's way, as it were. Uh, but you know, with a with a hat, and uh, you know, I mean, during the, I could see you know during the fall. In spring, when it's not really all that hot out, maybe you're wearing a hoodie or a long sleeve shirt, uh, you know, something like oh, that. Yeah. Uh, th- well, it's, th- this would be it, it's really all a, nice. it's all about the direct sun exposure. But anyway, what I was going to mention was I really like the clear lids, which is uh, the, the covers the same area, but it's uh, that um, uh, canopy, uh, you know, fighter pilot canopy, yeah, polycarbonate uh, material yeah. or something. Like I, th- that, yeah. I thought that was a really cool idea. Now, I don't know how hot it gets if you're driving down the road and you're That's getting that direct sunlight. You know? Think of a greenhouse. Yes. Pretty much made of the same material. So but, there you go. but the cool thing is is that it doesn't uh, keep you from being able to use the Freedom Top that you have. So I can see having one of these things, but at $1,300, sure. I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what the dealership is going to charge to install them. I'm sure that's another 1000 bucks. Who knows? Uh, really. So, uh, if anybody out there within the sound of my voice has one of these or has recently purchased a Jeep that, uh, uh, you got this as an option, uh, please let us know, give us a call, uh, right into the show. Uh, let us know what you think of it. And, uh, maybe we'll, uh, ask you a few questions and, uh, and get you get a review out of you. You know, I don't know where you, uh, you get your Jeep news from Josh, but this is funny because somebody in the uh, discord server posted this uh, this next one uh, up in there and I, I actually was going to send it to you because I thought it oh. you know the dumb criminal <laughs> stories <laughs> yes well uh, ever since we uh, crested uh, crested the 500 episode mark I- I've been making a-, a commitment to the show to to bring you guys more of the dumb criminal stories uh, they seem to be a big hit I have a lot of fun with them as well uh, and they they just are, are a really entertaining story and and why not if nothing else right? 
Uh, this week, it was a little bit of a slow week for dumb uh, Jeep criminals, uh, but this one, nonetheless, was, uh, was, was a pretty good one. A, a Sumter County man is wanted after, quote, unquote, failing to return a Jeep after taking it on a test drive. Eugene Ned, who's 45 years old, is wanted on the charges of breach of trust with fraudulent intent. Reports from the Sumter County Sheriff's Department say on October 18th, Ned test drove a 2019 Jeep Grand Cherokee and just never returned it back to the lot. <laughs> the dealership is located at 2600 Broad Street. If you see Ned, please call 911. If you have any information, well, call the Sumter County uh, Sheriff's Office, or you can also submit a tip to Crime Stoppers at MidlandCrimeStoppers.com. We've got a picture of both him and a 2019 Jeep Cherokee up on the website in the show notes for this episode at JeepTalkShow.com. Now, I got to wonder, and this is, I think, the comment that I made in the Discord uh, server is, what's the end game here? <laughs> I mean, you, you fork this what thing excuse? out in your head. I, really, what are the excuses? <laughs> I mean, we could, we could, you know, ballpark this all day long. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, I, I thought I had a three-day test drive period. I thought oh, I heard on the yeah. video that you guys offer, you know, three days. Was that not your dealership? Oh, I'm sorry. I must have been mistaken. My bad. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, what, what you know, uh, it's like, oh, I ran out of gas. Uh, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I, I, I've got a condition where I forget where I came from. Uh, let's see, where, where else can we go with this? Uh, you know, I know the sun was in my eyes. Uh, you know, the wife said I, I had to keep it no matter what. Uh, I just thought I'd, I would. I, I don't know. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, we don't know for sure, but I would think that at least you give false information. You know, you don't give them actually your, your name, your driver's license. You have one made. If you're going to, you know, steal the vehicle and I would assume that you don't plan on driving it, you're going to be taking it to or a chop shop or to have a, yeah, an oil change done at a shop or anything. Yeah, no, th this is, I mean, you're right. What's the end game here? How long can you really expect to, to play this one out? Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, it's just not a good idea. I'm sure a lot of us have thought about the, you know, I'm going to go to the Chevy dealership today and test drive a vet. Maybe just take that test drive and extend it for a week. Who knows? You know, what's the worst that could happen? So I know. Well, you're going to get the cops called. <laughs> you're going to get arrested. So I know there's some areas of the country that are uh, changing uh, shoplifting to a misdemeanor. Do you think maybe this guy just got confused and thought he was in one of those areas and it's kind of like shoplifting? <laughs> really, though. I mean, because in my neck of the woods, they're pretty much not prosecuting yeah. anything uh, underneath a murder. Uh, a rape or uh, a child abuse. I, I heard it on the radio this morning. They, they're just not investigating any crimes that are underneath those. It, it makes Welcome you, to Portland, Oregon, everybody. Yeah, it makes you wonder what the insurance companies are going to do because it's really just putting that putting on the insurance companies. Uh, I'm, to, sure to, to, a, I'm sure I've got a letter in the mail. To, to, <laughs> well, I'm, no, I'm thinking it's going to be. Well, you know, we hate to inform you, but we can no longer insure your business. Because, you know, oh, because you've had too many people not return the test drives. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, or just the shoplifting thing. I mean, the well, that's why Walgreens is is shutting up shop left and right I, all over. The place. I saw that. Yes, and then and now they're going to be complaining about uh, being underserved in certain areas. It's yeah. it's a crazy crazy yeah. time. So I, I wonder if this. I mean, making light of this, but I mean, I wonder if this has something to do with. The, the end game that I was talking about, I mean, it, do you think there's going to come a time where, you know, you take a test drive a vehicle and you don't bring it back? It's like, oh, well, you know, we, we had it long enough to try to sell it. Now now it's gone to a better home. <laughs> I just, oh, I just don't understand. <laughs> well, you know, okay, maybe there was a medical emergency. Maybe this guy had a heart attack or something. You know, a 2019 Grand Cherokee V8 or something like that. Who knows? It might be more horsepower than this guy's ever had in his life. Uh, and he went off of a stoplight a little too fast. And the heartbeat, you know, skipped a, uh, skipped a beat a little bit, and uh, and he ended up in the hospital. Well, I guess and the it's jeep possible. got impounded yeah. or something. It's still on the side of the road. Who knows, right? Uh, maybe uh, you know uh, he got a call and and Mama's in the hospital, uh, but she lives on the other side of the uh, of the nation, uh, and he didn't have a ride, so he's got a you know a, a 1978 Duster or something like that that is just on its last leg, and and that ain't gonna make it. So he decided to go for a test drive and something that would be comfortable to drive across seven states and well he's just visiting mommy you can't blame the guy right it'll be interesting uh hopefully we'll hear the the other half of this story and it'll be interesting to find out what the reasoning was what the end really? game was. i gotta hear the excuse i don't know <laughs>
Well, if you've got a news tip or response to any one of our stories, be sure to let us know what you have to say. And you can do it by phone or by email. Just head over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact to find out how to reach out. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. You most certainly are, you lucky listener, you. And did you know that the 4x4 Radio Network is the only place on the entire internet that you can get all of the world's best off-road related podcasts all in one place? You can hear the On the Trail podcast, Trail Chasers, the Center Steer podcast, even the 4x4 podcast is there, and the Jeep Talk Show is there too. Lots of great off-road shows, a little something different for everybody, and it's all for free, and it's all in one spot. That's 4x4radionetwork.com. We'll see you there. Hey, coming up in Tech Talk, we're wrapping up our multi-part series in hardtop repair. You know, Josh, um, I've been wanting to, uh, there's there's things that you do working on vehicles, and, and especially Jeeps, that one of the things that you want to be able to do is weld. Whether it is uh, your exhaust system, you know, be able to do your own exhaust modifications, a uh, lot cheaper, a lot easier to do it at home than it is to take some place and wait and then hopefully do it, they do it right. Do it wrong yourself, I say. So uh, I think a welder is almost one of those things that every Jeeper should have. Of course, not every Jeeper has the proclivity to use a welding machine, uh, or maybe they're just doubtful of their, their own abilities. But uh, I know I've wanted one for a while, and I believe you've done some welding uh, in oh, the sure. past. Uh, yeah, have, I even have a weld. Ha, yeah. it, what kind is it? Is it a stick, a MIG, a it is a, it's a It's a Lincoln. It's a 240-volt uh, uh, Lincoln MIG welder. Uh, I do not have a gas tank for it. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, currently gasless right now. Uh, that, that will change in, in the future, though. Uh, so I'm running a flux core uh, welding right now, and, and the reason for that is is and I'll get into uh, I'll get into the welding uh, a little bit. There's there's different kinds. Uh, Tony, you you mentioned stick. Uh, I mentioned MIG. There's also TIG welding. Uh, MIG stands for metal inert gas. TIG stands for tungsten inert gas. Uh, TIG welding is is uh, typically the go-to for things like aluminum, uh, stainless steel, uh, things like that. Uh, MIG is your go-to for for your average uh, your average welding for things like uh, uh, body panels, uh, bumpers, uh, suspension components, things like that. Any, anything made out of steel, uh, MIG is the way to go. Isn't and the, course, isn't the MIG traditionally a lot cleaner than like a stick welder? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And the reason for that is, is uh, typically a, a MIG welder has a, a gas tank a, a attached to it. Not gas like gasoline, but gas as in well metal inert gas MIG. Uh, and typically, this is a combination of uh, carbon dioxide and uh, uh, oh geez, and what is it? Uh, argon. Yeah, argon and carbon dioxide. I think is the uh, is the is the primary mix. Sometimes you can find a tri mix, and I think they throw like helium in there or something. The whole point of the gas is that it's well, it's non combustible gas, inert essentially, and and what it does is it creates a shield around the weld, and and it, it prevents splatter from happening a, a lot of the time. It creates a clean weld. Uh, it helps push that uh, that weld that that liquid metal uh, because we're talking about very high voltages here. Um, voltages enough to actually liquefy metal in a fraction of a second, and uh, and when we're talking about that, it, it's it's you know being able to push that liquid metal around, and and that's how you create a bead, and and a bead is is how is is kind of like well just like a caulking bead when you're caulking uh, you know like a, a around your sink or around a bathtub or around a window or something like that, you're laying down a bead of caulking. Well, it's not too dissimilar with uh, with welding. You're laying down a bead of weld, uh, but while you're doing that, you're melting the surface of the metal from both pieces of metal that you're trying to put together. Uh, and that's what welding is all about, is putting two pieces of metal together and creating something else, or repairing a, uh, a gouge or a hole or something like that in the metal. Or, or, uh, or a crack, like sometimes we see on frames and, and unit yeah, bodies. Absolutely. Let me ask you this real quick. <clears throat> now... Most everybody has 110 in their garage. Not not a lot of people have a, a 220 or 240 uh, That's outlet. Okay. Can you can you do MIG welding on a 110 uh, outlet, or do you need to go s- snake it over to the the, uh, the 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 dryer connection and get well, the that 240 that, over that's, there? <laughs> that's literally what I am doing in my garage. My my washer and dryer are in my garage, and I have to unplug my my uh, my dryer and uh, and I have a, a, a custom made extension cord that I made myself that I plug into there. 
uh, that I can then hook my welder up to and, and take it up to the end of the garage. Um, and, and so that, that's what I do. Now, you don't have to do the same thing. And you're thinking to yourself, well, geez, my, my uh, laundry room is inside my house. Uh, that extension cord is going to be long and big and heavy and expensive. And you don't have to do all that, honestly. Uh, if you want to get into welding and uh, you're unsure if this is something that you want to you try or not, uh, trust me, it, it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. And uh, being able to, to fix some serious damage to your Jeep uh, is really a lot of assurance uh, and, and, and peace of mind. And it doesn't take a whole lot of money to get into it, too. Um, yes, if you want to get really, really good equipment, it's going to cost you a pretty penny. But you don't need really, really good equipment to learn how to weld. And there are people who are always wanting to learn how to weld. And so if you get into, the, in, into this uh, hobby, if you will, uh, you can trade out your gear relatively easily and upgrade very, very easily. Um, I, I'm sure we're all familiar with a company called Harbor Freight Tools. Uh, and and they, they, you can get into welding very easily using a Harbor Freight welder. Now... Would, this wouldn't be something that you're going to build an exo cage with on the end of your uh, for the outside of your Jeep. You probably could, uh, but th you know this is going to be something. I mean, you can pick one up. I think nowadays for under $150, uh, for under $200, you can get yourself outfitted with a welding helmet, some gloves, the welder itself. It's going to have everything you need to get started. Uh, really, all you need at that point is a couple pieces of metal to stick together. I'm sure you can find some metal around the house, a bolt here, a, a nut there. Try, you know, hooking them up into the vise and just welding them together. And pretty soon, you figure some things out. Uh, watch some videos on YouTube. Walking around going, going, look at this. <laughs> look, I'll put these two things together. What are you going to do with that? I don't know, but I'll put it together. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, all of a sudden now you've figured out, you've taught yourself how to weld. And, uh, and now, well, maybe that uh, winch bumper that you've been looking at, uh, now all of a sudden that DIY version of it, uh, where they send you a box with a bunch of flat pieces of metal in it, and you stick them all together and weld it together. That's looking like a lot more realistic of an option now that you know how to weld, and you can save yourself a lot of money. Typically, those bumpers will cost anywhere from 35 to 50% less than what the finished product is. Uh, you know, a couple of bumpers that you weld together yourself, you just actually paid for the welder and all the equipment and the money that you saved. Yeah. So uh, my limited understanding is, is that when you go for the, the higher voltage, that means you can do higher current and that gives you better print penetration for like thicker metal. Is, th does that sound right? Yes. But I mean, let's look at it this way. Even the most hardcore bumpers are made of only quarter inch steel. And even then a lot of it's still only three sixteenths. And, and, and so even a one, uh, a 120 volt welder can weld up to one quarter inch just fine. Oh, interesting. Absolutely. Now, uh, some of that quarter inch, it, depending on the grade of steel, now tool steel, some really high carbon content steel or something like that, you may have a little bit of harder time with penetration. Um, you know, something that where, you know, yes, okay, maybe the bumper is made out of all quarter inch. Maybe all you have is a 120 welder. You're going to stick it together. I maybe wouldn't trust those welds for a recovery point. You're going to get penetration. The welds are going to stick together. It's going to be just fine. But I wouldn't try and pull an F-250 out of the mud with a, a, uh, a, a, an anchor point that I welded together with a 120 welder. That may just be me overanalyzing things a little bit. I'm sure once you figure things out and you really get your technique and your skill down uh, and you do something like a through weld where it's welded from both sides, uh, something like that, you're going to get plenty of penetration and it's going to be just fine. Uh, yeah, so, just, just you know, your own personal comfort factor is, is what absolutely. you're going with here. Yeah, so, absolutely. So it sounds like to me that, uh, the and this is what I've come up with just on uh, cursory uh, researching it, is that sure. a MIG welder is probably the, the best thing to go with. The stick welder, oh, absolutely. Uh, the stick welder is what I'm more familiar with whenever I was younger because the neighbors had one and some of the, uh, there was some. Well, that's some, where it all started. Some yeah. frame uh, damage that I had on the on, on a vehicle, and it got uh, taken care of with a uh, with a stick welder. But man, that thing is just really nasty. Stuff goes everywhere. It it welded just fine. I mean, it, it fixed the the cracked frame that I had, but uh, it, it seems like the MIG is a lot uh, more. It, how is it that the the in Star Wars they talk about the blaster being uh, this horrible weapon and the uh, uh, the uh, um, damn, I'm forgetting the name of it. The uh, 
the laser, the hand laser, the lightsaber. The lightsabers for a more civilized. <laughs> oh yes, right. <laughs> a more civilized Light individual. Lightsaber and, discussion. And the yeah. MIG, MIG being kind of a more civilized thing. So was it was it very difficult to uh, to get the the settings right? Did you have to have somebody? Uh, walk that's, you through it or that's where um a, a lot of the trial and error comes in now a lot of welders will have a chart built into a cover that is on the side of it you lift open a flap this is where you're going to get into the components uh change out the wiring for for different kinds of welding uh or you're going to swap out the actual welding wire um and it, on that flap on that lid if you will the underside of it is generally a chart almost all welders will have this chart and it's going to tell you uh, the different settings and what they mean for, for different kinds of projects. If you're going to be welding this thickness of metal uh, and you have this diameter of wire into the machine, you're going to have this setting. And, and, and those settings change depending on the wire thickness that you're using and the thickness of the metal that you're working with. And, and that will get you a, a starting point. And then you adjust from there. You may adjust down. You may adjust up. You may adjust your voltage up or down. You may adjust your wire speed, your, your feed uh, up and down, how much wire is pushed out of the end of the gun. Um, and, and how this works is, is essentially you're, you're grounding, you, if you will, um, your, your work surface, the metal that you're, that you're going to be welding. And then the gun itself is, is the positive end. And you're shorting it out. You're creating an arc of very, very high amperage electricity, high voltage. Um, that is enough to melt the metal and the wire itself and create a pool of molten metal that all hardens and bonds itself together and, and creates that, that creates that weld. Uh, and so depending on the diameter of that wire, uh, what it's made out of and the thickness of the metal and the kind of metal that you're using is going to determine all of those different settings, uh, the wire feed and, and voltage setting. And, and generally those are the only two settings that you really have to worry about on a, uh, on a entry level welder. Well, it's really cool, and <clears throat> I apologize. We're talking about this longer than what I anticipated, but it's just a really interesting subject, and uh, we're going to need to talk about it some more in the future. Why did you become a paid subscriber to the Jeep Talk Show? Jeep Talk Show is in my weekly rotation. Look forward to it every week, each and every Friday. You can be a paid subscriber and help support the show you love, the Jeep Talk Show. I support a great podcast. been a lifelong Jeeper myself. Continue to learn with each and every episode that I listen to. Just go to JeepTalkShow.com and look for the big yellow subscribe button. Absolutely. If you like Jeeps, anything to do with Jeeps, I like it for the, the technical, clear content, uh, advice, and learning. Yep, yep. If you'd like to become a paid subscriber to the Jeep Talk Show, just go over to jeeptalkshow.com. Uh, if you can go to slash contact, you can look up at the top where it says uh, store. Uh, there's uh, multiple ways to become a, a paid subscriber. Uh, just the, the, the key part is go to jeeptalkshow.com and poke around. You'll find it. jeeptalkshow.com slash contact. Probably the best way to go. And uh, you can, uh, there's uh, multiple levels uh, for paid subscriber. And uh, there's even uh, a way to uh, get some of those uh, uh, rat bastard toe tags if you'd like to uh, uh, infect uh, some, uh, some Jeeps, uh, an infectious agent. From the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G. And uh, last week, Wendy, you talked about somebody on your trail ride broke a sector shaft. I've actually seen that happen before. And we kind of uh, removed the drag link and kind of used it like he was walking his dog. It's the only way I could describe it, down the trail. And, you know, I, I believe Tammy Jeep Mama was there when, when that happened. It wasn't her Jeep, though. But I really don't think that's really that big of news, Wendy. I think you just wanted to see the look on Tony's face every time you mentioned the word shaft. <laughs> well, that's not why I'm calling. <laughs> calling to tell you i'm thinking about getting a job cleaning mirrors yeah it's something i can really see myself doing Man. all right boys and girls playing that one was horrible <laughs> all right i'll chat at you later have a good one bye you, you, uh, when you can't stand your own brand man you, you know <laughs> you know the fart the, the fart is really bad when you find it stinky <laughs> yeah exactly. oh great stuff you got tech questions? Ah, oh, what do I ever? We have answers. Oh, that's good. I can, I, it's Tech Talk with Jeep Talk. Yahoo!
In the last few Tech Talks, we've been going over the basic steps to repairing a fiberglass Jeep hardtop. If you haven't already listened to the other parts, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to the others, starting with episode 517. So, we last left you with the nitty-gritty process of rebuilding a section of your fiberglass hardtop. We focused on the two most common types of damage to the top, but there are others, and I'm going to cover them briefly right now. For instance, let's say a branch, rock, or some other hard object near your hardtop came into contact with each other right at the corner or edge of the side window or maybe the corner of the top itself. That's a critical area right there as both the glass and the seal need to work perfectly in order to keep the elements out and that window in. Now, rebuilding these edges require the same sort of steps but with a little bit more finesse. You'll still need to clean it up, mask off the area around it, and before replacing the window, you rebuild what you need with fiberglass. You see, once the fiberglass mat is saturated with the resin and you have enough of it all together, well, you can mold it kind of like clay. A very fibrous, hairy, extremely sticky clay that will not cooperate at all, but still, you get the point. After that, all those repairs, you need to do some finish work. And, and here is where we get into the more tedious side of things. The finish work is the process of taking that rough, messy patchwork of a repair and sanding it down to the level of the rest of the top. If you did the repair right, well, you should have some material to work with and providing you mixed your resin right and laid things down with as few bubbles as possible, critical right there, then what you're left with afterwards is, well, as you sand, will be a layer of cured fiberglass level with the rest of the surface of the top. Now, even in the case of an edge repair, Use a good straight edge to lay across the top at different points and angles to see high and low spots that will need more attention. Anything will work here, but I typically will grab a ruler. Now, obviously, with the case of a window opening, the lips must be uniform in height, width, and profile. Sanding fiberglass isn't terribly hard, but it is a little bit tedious. Especially with the right tools, it can be very, very tedious. But, uh, but again, it's not terribly hard. But not everybody has access to air tools and things like that, so sandpaper and elbow grease it's going to be. Regardless, you're going to want to start rough and finish with a higher grit sandpaper. The lower the number, the more aggressive it will be. You're going to start with something like 120. Yes, you can get more done a lot quicker by using 80 or even 60 grit, but the gouges that you're going to leave behind on the surface will be hard to ignore in the finishing stages, and trust me, you don't want to create more work for yourself. You're going to want to keep the sanding to the area of the repair and not color outside the lines, as it were, as much as you can. Now, when you are all done, you will no doubt be looking at a surface that resembles bread. It's going to have all kinds of holes and divots and material missing, etc. Now, depending on how bad it is, you can do one of two things. Get out the supplies again and fill in where you need and sand and repeat as necessary. What I would do, providing you don't have any holes that go all the way through, is simply fill them in by hand with some mixed up resin. Wearing a glove, of course, you dip your finger into the resin, Again, just the tip, and dab, smear, or fill the holes as best you can. A scraper would be ideal to run over the surface to help push the air bubbles out and force the resin down while cleaning the surface up a little bit of any excess resin. A quick disposable scraper can be made from a piece of cardboard that can hold up to the job. Serious, uh, a cereal cardboard, a cereal box cardboard, or a 3x5 note card will actually work very well as disposable scrapers. Either way, you're going to be sanding again after it cures to get a uniform surface. Another option would be to use some Bondo, but that gets into a whole other series of segments altogether. And for small repairs, I don't think it's all that necessary. Now, finish the sanding and filling with a high grit 400 or better at bare minimum. Some will say take it all the way to 800 or better, but we're not looking for professional level bodywork quality here, and that's going to be okay. And I will explain why in just a moment. At this point, you're going to have what can only be described as a blemish on the hardtop. I started this whole series by saying that if you have a color-matched hardtop, that a whole other level of skills are going to be required to make it look good again. Even so, there's still going to be some work that will need to be done to make sure that the final steps will have good results. Painting the top. That's what I'm talking about here. Depending on the age of the top, you may opt to mask off the windows, rear hatch, hinges, and seals, and all that sort of stuff, and just paint the whole darn thing which is actually a lot easier than you think. Otherwise, you're going to have some very black paint on a very not black top or tan or whatever your color top is. Now, I'd recommend using bed liner for repainting the hard top. Its bumpy finish and thick texture is perfect for hiding the small imperfections of your repair and sanding. The roll-on kind would work very well, but I've had good results, oddly enough, with the spray can version from DuPont with Teflon in it. Makes for easy cleanups after a day in the dirt. 
But if by now you feel overwhelmed and unsure if this is something that you even want to try on your own hardtop, well, let me give you an alternative to half of this. It's called kitty hair. That's right, kitty hair. What it is is a mixture of fiberglass and Bondo together. You still mix it with a hardening agent and it and will need to mask things off to a certain extent. You'll still need to fill and sand like before, but it reduces a lot of the prep and the risk and it's a lot easier to work with. The results can be arguably different though, and it may not adhere as well to the top or stay in place as the top flexes with the Jeep on the trail, depending on a number of factors too. Now, either way, here's some advice if you want to get practice, if you want to get some practice in using either fiberglass or kitty hair. Go down to the local wrecking yard and see if they have any totaled vehicles with fiberglass tops. Doesn't have to be a Jeep per se, could be anything. But be armed with a cordless sawzall or hole saw though. But go find you a chunk of, you know, junk hard top to go practice on. All you need is about one square foot chunk or less, but, you know, don't go and take a hole saw to that abandoned boat down in the industrial district. <laughs> boat holes use both fiberglass and gel coat, which is a whole entirely different beast altogether, and it's nothing you want to mess with in practicing for your Jeep repair. Another option would be to go to your local Lowe's or Home Depot hardware store and uh, go to the roofing section and see if they have any corrugated fiberglass roofing. This is going to be the green stuff that you typically see on porch covers or shed roofs. It's going to be about 10 times thinner than a Jeep top, but punch a few holes in it, snap off a corner, and see if you can't fix it. It'll be good practice. Chances are, however, that all you're going to find is polycarbonate panels, which absolutely will not work for this, so don't even bother. Look around, and if you see one that resembles the fibrous nature of a fiberglass, well, then you've found what you're looking for. Now, I know all this seems way out of your ability to pull off, but if you're even thinking about it, I'd say give it a shot. I mean, it's already damaged, so uh, and I think people will be really surprised at their capabilities just doing it and then getting an understanding of uh, how it's how you know how it goes together. And it's none of this stuff is is overly complex. We're not uh, launching something to uh, low Earth orbit. It's it's just a repair that has to look good and repel water. Pretty much. Now, like with anything, you're learning a new skill set here. You're working with some new materials that you've never used before. It's kind of like riding a bike, honestly. It's going to take some practice at first. You're probably going to fall down and, and, and you know, bruise yourself. You're, you're going to get hurt. You know, who knows? Um, but, uh, no, not, not really. You're not going to injure yourself uh, doing this sort of stuff. But really, it's going to give you a nice skill set, a, a something else that you can turn to uh, and, and learn about. And, and honestly, the world of fiberglass uh, it opens the doors to a lot of possibilities as far as just fabrication in your own life, uh, personally. Uh, plus, it's really cool and fun to work with. So, uh, if nothing else, I mean, you can get everything started for well under a hundred bucks, uh, and and have everything that you need to, including the tools, uh, to get started and and do this sort of stuff, and uh, and figure out if this is going to be for you and if it's something that you can actually pull off and do on something more serious like the actual top on your Jeep. Yep. Uh, oh, and also uh, make sure that you take uh, all the safety measures into uh, in, into consideration. You want to make sure that you uh, protect your eyes, your hands, anything that the uh, fiberglass might get on, and and of course, and your uh, lungs. yes, yeah. yes, and in, inhaling the, uh, the the nauseous chemicals. Uh, I can't think you can get quite high off of fiberglass, can't you? Well, it's not it's not just that, Tony. It's the it's the uh, when you're sanding and stuff. I mean, I, I talked about using a, a protective equipment when you're actually working with the fiberglass. I mean, this goes doubly for when you're doing the finish work and, and sanding. Fiberglass dust is going to be just as irritating to your nasal passages, your eyes, uh, your lungs, everything else um, as anything else in this whole process is. So, uh, really, if you're going to be using safety equipment now during this final stage, is the time to do it if you're going to do it at all. Yep, yep. So, be careful. Uh, don't, uh, don't just leave it up to the Jeep Talk Show to uh, give you uh, uh, safety tips. There's lots of searching you can do and uh, lots of reading you can do. Just be safe when you're doing this stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, YouTube is your friend. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure there's a fiberglass for dummies book out there, <laughs> that, you know, would have some good information for it. But uh, do as much of the research a as you can and teach yourself uh, everything you need to know. There's a lot of stuff on out there to learn uh, and you can pick this stuff up. Well, if you have anything to add, maybe you have a question for Tech Talk, just jump over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and be sure to send us a message. Hey, don't forget, Jeeper, it's very easy to sign up for the Jeep Talk Show newsletter. All the great information about what's going on with the show and 
the links and all the other information you need to join in on the fun is all in the newsletter. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and you're going to find a link to click and sign up. Hey, don't worry. It's just as easy to unsubscribe as it is to subscribe. Well, that's it for the show for this week, my fellow Jeeper. Until next week, be sure to become a paid subscriber. And as always, thank you for listening to the world's most downloaded Jeep podcast. And of all the paths that you take in life, make sure at least some of them are dirt and rock. Oh, yeah. Podcasting since 2010.